Good afternoon. Uh, most of you know my name is Mark Sattler. I teach history here, and I'm also the head of the. Hi. Oh, you guys are so cute. Uh, I'm also head of the chair of the Global Education Committee, uh, and this is part of the Global Awareness Lecture Series. This will be the last one uh, for this semester. I hope that we can continue this going on into the next years. We've had some excellent speakers, some wonderful presentations, and I look forward to continuing that tradition today and on into next year. We are privileged to have Dr. Nicholas Steiner with us today. Dr. Steiner is director of the Center for Global Initiatives at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I hope many of you will join him as students later on in your career. He earned a BA with highest honors in international studies at the University of North Carolina and a PhD in political science at Northwestern University. This dude is smart. His research and teaching interests are immigration, refugees, nationalism, and citizenship, subjects he'll be addressing today. He is very well published. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Steiner. Thank you all so very much. Should I push this away? I tend to wander around, which is why I've got a, a lapel on. I'm, I'm very excited to be here talking to you about this issue, which is incredibly controversial. And I'm just warning you right now, you're probably going to leave with many more questions than answers. Uh, this is an issue that at, at the surface seems pretty straightforward, but as soon as you start scratching a little bit, you realize there's so many complications here. So that's what I want to talk to you about today, especially the controversy around it, immigration and citizenship. And I think there are three main questions that raise so much controversy. And I want to focus on those today. One is how do we deal with all the people from around the world who want to come to our country? Secondly, how do we deal with all the people that we don't want in our country from other, other parts of the world, but who make it in anyway? And then the third question is, once they are here, how do we make them a part of us? which is an essential part of being a democracy. Before I go through those three questions, let me say something as a, as a stage setter, which is that we're at a really unique time in history when it comes to immigration. Because never before has it been so cheap and so easy and so fast for people to move. Never before. I mean, any of us with a passport and a credit card could get in our cars, drive to the Greensboro airport, and be in China within a day. That's unbelievable. But never before have governments had so much power to control our movement. Both the US government and the Chinese government would have no problem stopping us from making that trip. So on the one hand, we have the ability to move. And on the other hand, the government has the ability to control that movement. And there's so much tension and conflict over that. So how do we deal with the first question? How do we deal with all those people in other parts of the world who want to come here? Well, there are a number of ways that we could deal with this. The first I want to put out is what Canada does. And maybe some of you know this. They have what's a point system. They very clearly spell out who they want and who they don't really want, what kind of traits they want. And then they assign a would-be immigrant points. And you can get a maximum of 100 points. And I think 66 is the passing. And you get a certain amount of points for your age. So you're going to get more points as a 25-year-old than a 50-year-old. You're going to get more points for education level and your job experience. And if you have family in Canada already, and if you speak English and French, it's very much like a teacher grading a student. That's the point system. We don't do that here in the United States. But a lot of people think we should. And that's an interesting question that we can talk about later. Another way to deal with people who want to come into our country is through guest worker programs. And some of you are probably familiar with those because we have those in the United States. 
The point about guest worker programs is to take the term very literally. They are guest workers. We want them as workers, and we want them to be guests so that when we don't want them anymore, they go back home. Guest workers can be essential to building up an economy. You might know that after World War II, Europe was really ruined, and they rebuilt largely on the basis of guest workers. But it was very clear that Switzerland, which is where I'm from, would bring in an Italian guest worker for nine months. And nine months later, he'd have to physically leave the country and then maybe be let back in for nine months on a rotating basis. Family had to stay at home. We're not interested in you and your family to settle here. We're interested in you to come here, do work, and leave again when we want you to leave. We have the same uh, uh, guest worker programs here. The problem with guest worker programs, as you may know, it's fairly easy for people, those guest workers, to actually stay. We can talk a little bit more about that later on. We don't have nearly as much control over these guest workers as we'd like to have, which makes it very controversial. Another thing that the US has, and this is not terribly well known, it's always, it's always interesting to discuss in a class, we have some so-called investor visas. This is rich foreigners can start businesses in the United States. I think it's with a minimum of a million dollars. If they walk in, put a million dollars down to invest in a business that's going to create jobs for Americans, we'll let you in and we'll give you a visa. Some of my students think that's a no-brainer, that's brilliant. And others are appalled. They don't like the idea of essentially selling citizenship to foreigners. They don't think that's a good idea. Another way the U.S. deals with admitting foreigners is through complete randomness. It's the diversity lottery. Once a year, anyone, pretty much anyone from abroad can go to a website. I think it's diversitylottery.gov, and you put in your name. And then sure enough, once a year, the U.S. government pulls out, I think it's 55,000 names randomly. I think the minimum requirement is you have to be 18 and you have to have a high school education. So completely random. But the main way the US lets in people is through family reu reunification. And this is the policy that has really driven US immigration policy since 1965 when this was admitted. About 70% of all people who are let into this country are let in because they have family who's already here. Again, there's one of these issues that makes a lot of sense, but if you start scratching a little bit, you realize, whoa, that depends really on your definition of family. How expansive do we want to make the definition in order to let you in? To let your immediate child in, probably uncontroversial, right? And let your parents in, probably uncontroversial. Letting your brother in? Yeah, that's probably family. Letting your uncle in? Letting in your second cousin twice removed in? At what point do you say, nope, sorry, you're no longer really family? That can be difficult in societies that have very broad conceptions of family, where it's really a whole clan, almost a whole neighborhood is considered family. Also, how do you prove that someone's actually a family member? I, mean, I guess you could do DNA testing, but that would leave off children that were adopted. So it's a great example of, hey, let's let in family members. Seems like a great idea until you start thinking a little bit about it and you go, whoa, that there's more to this than meets the eye at first. Let me take a very quick detour and talk about another group of people who want to come into our country that don't get that much attention in the United States, but they're it's a big issue in Europe, and that's refugees. So refugees are in some ways fundamentally different from immigrants. And one easy cut at it is immigrants are people who voluntarily leave their country, right? It's, it's a, a doctor from Britain who just wants to make, have a better life in the United States. 
Refugees leave their countries involuntarily. They're forced to flee. And it's because they're forced to flee that we have this moral obligation to let in refugees. Many of us would not really say that we have much of a moral obligation to let in immigrants. But most of us would agree there's a moral obligation to let in refugees. Those people are persecuted at home. That's not the controversy. Whether we should let in refugees or not, it's not terribly controversial. The controversy is, who is a refugee? What exactly constitutes persecution? So a standard definition that's widely accepted is from the United Nations. And they say, this was a, a declaration made in 1951, that refugees are people who are persecuted by their governments because of their race, religion, nationality, or political opinion. So that's pretty easy to get your head around, right? If you're a Christian minister running a church somewhere where Christianity is a minority religion and the church gets burnt down and your congregation is harassed, you could well make the case, come to the United States and say, I'm persecuted because of my religious beliefs. Or if you're a journalist who's criticizing a dictator and you get dragged into jail and you're tortured and eventually you're released, I think we'd all agree, yes, that's persecution. What about other things? So in Saudi Arabia, women do not have the right to vote. Is that persecution? Probably, I suppose. But they also don't have the right to drive. Is that persecution? Would you give, if a Saudi Arabian woman showed up in the US and said, give me asylum, let me in, I'm not allowed to drive, and I'm being persecuted by the government, do we have a moral obligation to that? Or is that somehow, well, that's not good, that's bad, that's discrimination, but there's kind of a spectrum between discrimination and persecution, and that's still over here, and at some point you cross a threshold, and then we'll let you in. Also, we have to say that to be considered a refugee, you have to be persecuted by your government. Well, unfortunately, there are lots of things that are doing, there are lots of people and organizations that are doing terrible things to people that are not governments, like the Taliban in Afghanistan, right? That's not the government of, of Afghanistan, that's a militant group. So should you be able to come to the United States and say, I'm being persecuted by the Taliban, let me in? The problem there is, a lot of times the US and other countries will say, well, I'm so sorry that you're being terrorized by this guerrilla group or that gang or whatever, but that's not our responsibility. That's your government's responsibility. So go back home and be protected by your government. Makes sense, except if your government's not able or not willing to protect you. Then what do you do? And then, so we talked about briefly the, 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 the issues that, are being, uh, that you're granted asylum for are race, religion, nationality, political opinion. Increasingly, people are talking about other things that are driving you from your home, that are forcing you to flee. Environmental factors. Right? You're going to hear more and more from people who are having to leave islands in the Pacific because of climate change and rising waters. If someone has to flee their home because of an environmental disaster, is that a grounds for giving them asylum? Well, probably not if, if it was a hurricane. If a hurricane blows through Haiti, that's terrible. We feel really bad, but we have no obligation there really, maybe. But what about if the environmental crisis is because of something that your government did? So in China, there was a huge dam that was built. Like a million and a half people lost their houses. You know, and China's a, a ruthless dictatorship. They don't go about deciding things democratically. So a million and a half peasants lose their house and are forced to flee. Could they show up in the United States and say, hey, my government persecuted me. They forced me to flee my home because of this dam they built. Should we give them 
asylum. Homosexuality. We all know there are many people around the world who are persecuted by their homosexuality or by their gender. There are people who claim, who come to the United States and argue that I am persecuted because my spouse abuses me. That's an interesting one, right? Domestic violence. And in fact, there was a woman from Guatemala who not too long ago was granted refugee status in the United States because she was able to argue convincingly that she kept going to the police, kept going to the government in Guatemala, kept reporting her husband, and they never did anything. And this neglect on the government's part was a form of persecution, so the U.S. granted her asylum. Most overwhelming of all, there are people who say, you know what, poverty is a ground for asylum. That frankly, whether you're miserable and suffering because a police officer is banging you over the head, or if it's hunger and you're starving, both are bad and we have a moral obligation to let you in. Well, whoa, that's of course completely overwhelming. I mean, there are I think a billion people who live on a dollar a day in extreme poverty around the world. We can't possibly give them all asylum. But it does raise an interesting question. Since we as a democracy feel this moral obligation to let in people who are persecuted, how far does that extend? When do we think that the treatment is bad enough to let them in? So that's about all these different kinds of people who want to come in and how we might possibly decide who to let in. The second question I have for you is how do we deal with those people who we didn't really invite in, but they got in anyway? And this, of course, is such a controversial issue in the United States today. So one area, one place people quickly go is border control. Let's build better borders. Technically, that's certainly possible. You could build a 2,000 mile wall from Brownsville, Texas to San Diego. You can make it 30 feet high. And I'm, 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 I'm deliberately being glib here, but you could electrify it, right? If you, touch this, if you touch this fence, you will die of an electrical shock. And just for good measure, you can mount it with motion sensing machine guns so that anyone who comes within 50 feet of this fence would just be killed. You could technically do that, and that would be an effective wall to keep people from crossing. But that is absolutely out of the question for democracy like ours. We just don't do things like that. Brutal dictatorships like North Korea, they build walls. Communist Soviet Union, they built walls. We don't do those kind of things. Yes, we build some walls right now. There's one being built, I think it's 700 miles long. Never quite understood why they end it there, because after all, couldn't you just go to the 701st mile and sort of walk around? But that's for the politicians to decide. But you can build a very effective wall technically, but I think politically, Morally, that's not going to fly. Plus, let me tell you something that a lot of people don't consider when they talk about border control. About a third of the people who are in this country illegally came in through perfectly legal means. We let them in originally perfectly legally. They came in as students. They came in as tourists. They came in as workers, and then they simply overstayed their visas. We simply lost track of them. And I'll say a little bit more about that, but essentially, we don't want to track people. It is fundamentally un-American to track people, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So even if you could have an absolutely perfect wall with Mexico, and forget, don't forget, Canada, of course, that becomes way more than 2,000 miles. Even if you had that, you'd still have a very significant population who's here without our authorization. 
So a wall is not going to be the simple answer. Something else that people reach for to deal with this population is mass deportation. Likewise, not going to solve the problem. There is simply no way you're going to deport 12 million people. Just logistically, 12 million, 12 million people is the population of Ohio. And I think that's, what's the population of North Carolina, like 10? Okay, so it's even bigger than North Carolina. Imagine, let's, take, let's bring it home, that the government, the federal government is going to try to round up every single person in the United States and get them on a bus from, round them up from Reedsville to Winston-Salem to New Bern and get them on a bus. It's not going to happen. Plus, of course, they're not conveniently all located in one state like here. They'd be sprinkled all 12 million across the country. It's not going to happen. And you notice people, people have really not talking about mass deportation anymore because they realize that's simply not a feasible solution to this issue. One thing that probably would work pretty effectively are employer sanctions, right? After all, these people come to do work. So they're hired. So if you punish the people who are hiring them, that would probably have a big impact. A Couple of problems with that. First of all, employers tend to be pretty powerful lobbyists in DC. And there have been attempts to have employer sanctions, but they get pretty watered down. But secondly, and equally importantly, is employers very reasonably make the argument, look, I'm trying to run a business. I'm trying to grow crops in the field. I'm not an immigration expert. That's you guys' job. You federal government, you guys need to worry about immigration. Don't push this off on us. I have no idea what documentation is needed. I have no idea what's a fake document or not. That's not my job. My job is to hire people and produce goods. So while employer sanctions seem like a good idea, I think you're going to have a really hard time convincing employers that, that they have to do this and that they're going to do it terribly well. National ID cards are another thing that could affect this issue very much. You might have never thought about this, but there is in fact not a single required government document that any of us have to have. You don't have to have a driver's license. You apply for that. You don't have to have a social security number. You apply for that. There are countries around the world that cannot believe that the United States doesn't have a way of identifying every single person who's in this country. It wouldn't be that difficult, right? The federal government would simply issue everyone a card, photo ID, maybe fingerprints or something, and you'd have to show it. Police could ask for it at any time, and if you don't have that card, you're in big trouble. Well, I bet you a lot of you are appalled by that idea because the United States really prides itself on individual freedom and not having the government have that kind of power over you. And I think this is an issue, these national ID cards is an issue that really divides conservative Republicans. Many of them really want to fight illegal immigration, but fight virulently against this national ID card. It's an interesting debate. But if you go to Singapore, which is where I was recently, they just can't believe we don't have a national ID card. They go, but how do you keep track of people? And I say, well, we don't. And that's kind of the point. That goes back to the issue of why guest workers programs aren't that terribly effective. Because we deliberately don't really track them that well because we don't like the idea of the government having that much power over us. The last thing that's on the table for dealing with immigrants who are in this country without our authority is immigration reform. And that's what's been in the news so much. 
Immigration reform is simply giving them legal status. It used to be called, amnesty was a term that was used a while ago, but that's become such a poisonous term. People who oppose this are always talking about, oh, this is just amnesty. And it is uh, an incredibly, it would be an incredibly simple way of dealing with this issue. With the flick of a pen, you no longer have 12 million people who are in this country illegally. They've, of course, not left, but what you've done is given them legal status. So this is something that the Democrats and the Republicans strongly disagree on. So Obama is for it. The Senate in D.C., controlled by the Democrats, is for it and has passed it, but it's stuck in the House, which is controlled by the Republicans. And it's probably not, I don't see it going anywhere as long as those are the dynamics in D.C., now, I think one problem with this issue of amnesty or immigration reform or legalization, whatever you want to call it, is they already did it once in 1986. About three and a half million immigrants were given legal status. And I think back then they made, the people who pushed this made the mistake of saying, this is it. This is the last time we're going to do it. We've solved the problem. Well, within a few years, those numbers climbed again to three million and they eventually rose to 12 million. So I would be humble and modest in pushing this and say, look, this is not going to solve the problem long term. This is a short term problem that we should do because no one really benefits from 12 million people with the status in our society. But let's be honest, as long as we have so many jobs here that we don't want to do, and life here is so much better than in other countries, we're going to have people come here. So I'm sorry to say, but I think the only real long-term solution to this issue is economic and political development in other countries. And we'll get there. We will at some point get to far, far fewer Mexicans coming to the United States once the Mexican economy and politics picks up. I wouldn't be surprised, and I don't mean to be, be glib about this, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point we're going down to Mexico to recruit workers again. Because the fact of the matter is, we need these people. We don't want them, but we need them. Because they're doing the work that we don't want to do anymore. And this is not just an issue in the United States. This is all over wealthier countries are constantly importing people to do the work that's no longer being done by locals. You see this throughout Europe and, and Asia. So, let me Turn to the third question, because I want to leave plenty of time for questions and, and comments. So assume we've now decided, okay, we're letting you and you and you and you in. Now we need to make you a part of us. Why? Because we are a democracy. And the people rule a democracy, which means that we have to decide well, who are going to be part of the people? Who is going to become a citizen? And as you may know, as you, when you're admitted into this country, first you get various visas, uh, eventually a, a so-called green card, and after five years you can apply for citizenship. Did any of you acquire citizenship through a naturalization process? Raise your hand if you did. I assume no one, but maybe. I actually did. So I'm from Switzerland originally, and I came to the U.S. when I was little. And when I was about 25, I applied for citizenship. Fascinating process. Fascinating process, because ultimately it's a process that we citizens came up with to measure others and what they need to think or do to become part of us. So as you may know, there's a test. There's a civics test, and there's a reading and a writing test. Let me give you the questions I, I asked, and, and you'll, well, you might know these. You should know, let me say, you should know these. If you don't, uh, someone else will bail you out. So the, keep in mind, so I'm, I'm in a PhD program in political science. I ought to pass this, right? First question, what day was the Declaration of Independence signed? Shout it out. 
What day? July 4th. July 4th. What year? 1776. What city? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. What are the three branches of government? Easy, right? PhD, come on. What is the Constitution? I said, well, it's, it's the document that spells out how the government works. No, no, that's what it does. What is it? Um, it, 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 it spells out what it takes to be a president and what the Senate does and how. No, no, that's what it does. What is it? Now I'm starting to get nervous, right? Now my PhD suddenly on the line. I try a few more feeble attempts. I finally give up. I said, I don't know. What is the tech Constitution? Anyone know what it is? The supreme law of the land. Who knew? It's the supreme law of the land. I passed that part anyway, which, by the way, is not terribly difficult to find out because you can Google citizenship test, and the, the hundred questions that they'll ask you will come right up. So all you got to do is memorize those. Then I had to pass a writing test and a reading test. So the, the officer handed me a sheet of paper and said, now it's time for your reading test. And I looked at it and I said, and I started laughing. I said, you're joking, right? Well, believe me, immigration officers do not joke when it comes time to administer a citizenship test. So I said, OK. The cat sat on the mat. And I passed the reading test. And then I had to write something similarly simple. That's, of course, of course, absurdly easy for me. But let's be honest. If you're illiterate in your own language, that would be a very difficult thing to pass. So it makes you wonder, well, maybe a PhD candidate should get one test, and an illiterate person from some country who doesn't speak any English should get another test. Oh, that's a slippery slope if you start handing out different citizenship tests for different kinds of people. So that kind of got me wondering, well, what ultimately is the point of a citizenship test? I mean, what are we citizens trying to gauge in what others are able to do? I mean, arguably, I, I'm, yes, it's, it's, it's important to know what uh, that uh, the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, but arguably it's more important to just be able to navigate everyday life in America. So know what an ATM is. Know how to open a checking account. Maybe know how to drive a car or read a bus schedule. For that matter, maybe there's sort of cultural things that we Americans that kind of bind us that we need to know about. You need to know what a Big Mac is and what it means to supersize something. Or who Michael Jordan is, or Billie Holiday, or William Faulkner. Maybe there should be no test at all. Maybe we should say, you know what, if you've been with us for a certain amount of years, pick whatever you want, five years, 10 years, 20 years. If you're still here 20 years later, You've demonstrated that you're loyal, that you want to be a part of us, so we'll just hand out citizenship automatically after a certain amount of time. Or maybe the exact opposite. Maybe we make this test really, really, really hard. So most people flunk. Hand out Huck Finn. Have people write a 10-page essay on how Huck Finn reflects American ideology. I don't know. You probably don't fully know what these citizenship tests are supposed to gauge. But we ought to, since it's we Americans trying to assess if someone else is American enough to become part of us. So what does that even mean to be American? A lot of times, citizenship is used synonymously with loyalty. We want our citizens to be loyal. But what's important here is there are a lot of citizens who are not terribly loyal to the United States, right? I mean, kind of a, a glib example, the people in Texas, the secessionists in Texas who want to break off from the United States. 
Right? They're U.S. citizens, but they basically don't want to be part of the U.S. anymore. Well, that's not terribly loyal. And we all know there's so many people who are not citizens who are incredibly loyal to the United States. Some of the most patriotic people I've encountered are people, immigrants, who are not citizens. The military accepts people who are not citizens. There are about 30,000 non-citizens in the military at one point. And you would think, well, don't you need to make absolutely certain that the soldiers join the military are absolutely loyal? Sure. And so just because you're a citizen does not mean you're loyal and vice versa. I think what really, ultimately, what I've come down to on this whole issue is we need to make sure that people don't feel marginalized. If we've let them in, they need to feel like they are a part of us. Because they are here. Whether you like it or not, they are a part of us. They are a member of our community. And I say this very deliberately because Europe has done a terrible job with this. Europe, so many people have come to Europe as guest workers and have just stayed. But the Europeans have constantly, for the last 50 years, kind of been almost under the illusion, well, they'll sooner or later go home again. They're not going home. They are here to stay, so you might as well start dealing with them. So for all the problems we have in the United States over this issue, we're doing much better than the Europeans, in part because we understand, well, ultimately, we are a country of immigrants. Europeans don't see themselves as that. And I would say one, one important issue is on this marginalization, back to the question of people in this country without proper documentation or illegally here, is yes, they're not authorized to do that. And yes, that's in violation of the law, but our entire judicial system is based on gradations of violating the law. You've got jaywalking and you've got murder. You obviously are treating jaywalkers very different from murderers. So how are we going to deal with people who are in this country contrary to our will? I would argue it should be much more on the side of jaywalking than on this side. Because the further we push on this side, the more marginalized they're going to be, the more pro societal problems we're going to have along the lines of what, what they're having in Europe today. Ultimately, though, and I want to wrap up with just a very simple thought, what we really need to do is think about this issue. What we really need to do is have good, hard, honest conversations, air our disagreements, because I found this issue is way too polarizing. There are way too many people over here and way too many people over here, and they just don't listen to each other. And we've got to move to the middle and try to find common ground. There is common ground on this issue, but we've got to be able to We've got to be willing to have honest conversations and not, frankly, just yell at each other or ignore each other on this issue. So I would love to hear thoughts, comments, criticisms, and I'm mindful that some of you need to leave for a class at two. So I want, to, I want to stop there and open it up for anything. Basically, how do we deal with people coming to this country illegally for terrorist motives? And how do we screen about that? Did I, did I reflect that accurately? No, that's, that's, a, that's a, a certainly a concern worth having. Um, what I would say to that, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on this issue, but one very important thing to note, the hijackers of 9-11, they were immigrants, but not in the United States. Many of them were in Europe. Many of them were exactly those alienated people in Europe who were not really brought into society were marginalized, and that brought all kinds of uh, issues with them. Um, I, I don't know, I've not heard, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but much evidence that there are terrorists sneaking across the borders uh, to, to do us harm. I mean, I think, it's, it's, frankly, it's easy enough to get into this country legally that you don't have to go through the trouble of, of coming in illegal. I mean, Again, those 9-11 those terrorists, they came in, I'm pretty sure, uh, through legal means, having been alienated elsewhere. And how the two relate to each other. I guess I would try, I would try 
to regularize immigration. If you want to come into our country, we ought to let you in, but screen you in a very effective way. So I would like to get to the point where we don't have people sneaking across the border because they have other ways of getting in. And those other ways would entail exactly the kind of suggestions you're making, which is a very good one. Make sure we really study who they are and that they don't mean us any harm. Would you address the issue of international trade agreements? I would love to address that because that's a whole other can of worms that deliberately didn't bring up. But since you did, I'll bring it up. Immigration, as I'm trying to make clear, it's an awfully complicated issue that tie together so many things, including trade agreements. And you think, well, really? How is that possible? Well, a very good example is NAFTA. So NAFTA was the North American Free Trade Agreement that created a common market between Mexico and the United States. Brought all kinds of benefits to the United States. One thing it did do was allow cheap American corn to move to Mexico. Well, you've seen corn farms in the United States. They're massive. They produce a lot of very cheap corn. That stuff gets moved to Mexico. What is it doing there? It's undermining the corn market in Mexico. Corn farms in Mexico can't compete. They shut down. They first moved to Mexico City or, or, or an urban city, and then they come to the United States. So there's, not, there's a direct connection between NAFTA passing in 94 and the rise of illegal immigration thereafter. Not just trade agreements, but arms dealers, right? And the US is the largest arms dealer in the world. All kinds of conflict is fueled by our actions, which causes refugee flows who then want to come to us. So it's all very much intertwined. So you really can't pick apart immigration from all these other things and say, well, I'm just going to nibble on the immigration issue and try to solve it. It's tied in with terrorism, as you suggest. It's tied in with trade agreements. It's tied in with demographics. I mean, we have a falling population rate. We need people. We don't need people as badly as Japan or Russia, which need them even more. And yet, ironically, Japan is extremely xenophobic. They desperately need people, but don't want them. Yeah? Uh, what's the point of making, uh, making everybody dislike us, you know, the idea of being American when instead of diver the diversity of what makes the country great anyway? So what's the point of making everybody, everybody dislike us? The question is, what's the point of trying to make everyone American, everyone make everyone kind of alike since diversity is such a valued aspect of the United States? Did I get that question right? Yes, and that's an excellent question. And in fact, it, I always, in my class, I try to come up with the students with a long list of what makes us American. The list is always unbelievably short. It seems like freedom. <laughs> no, no, but that, that's legit. I totally get that. Freedom comes up, but after that, people stall, and it kind of quickly comes to, well, you know what? It's almost the lack of an identity that makes us American. It's almost the diversity that, what's a, what I think is so wonderful about this country is that to be American means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and we tend not to really question each other. Again, that's very different from Europe. And if you go to Switzerland, they have a very narrow conception of what it means to be Swiss. On that point, let me say, I'm glad you brought that up, because actually I wanted to mention this. The, the big advantage that the United States has on this whole issue is birth by uh, citizenship by birth. If you're Born in the United States, you are an American citizen, no questions asked. Interestingly enough, that has nothing to do with immigration. That had to do with the end of the Civil War and the 14th Amendment passed in 1868 to make sure that free slaves did not become disenfranchised. But it means that immigrants can come into this country illegally they have children, those children are automatic citizens. Now there are people who want to change that law. And I beg them not to do that. Because that is the great strength in the United States and that's the great mess in Europe. Most European countries 
have citizenship by blood. I am Swiss because my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents were Swiss. I've got this Swissness in me. So it's very difficult for the Swiss to accept that a non-white person can be Swiss. They're going to go, where is that Swissness? And I think in the United States, and this is what's so important, we tend to have an incredibly tolerant view of what it means to be American. If someone walks in here right now and says, I'm American, I think most of us would say, yep, regardless of your beliefs, regardless of how you look. So I think it's the diversity and the easy access to citizenship that, is, that has kept this problem from exploding in the way it has in Europe. And I really think people should not mess with, with citizenship by birth. I think that's, a, that's asking for trouble. Um, I'm sorry, let me have a question right here. Great question. Why? Kind of two different questions. Why is it? Why is it not racist? Right. That's a double negative. Can you say? Can you say straightforward? Is it racist to say that we need other people to come in and do the work we no longer want to do? And why aren't people who don't have work doing the jobs we want that we need to bring people in? Fundamental question, absolutely essential. So the way I think about this is in two ways. First of all, these are hard, dirty, dangerous jobs. Working in a chicken uh, plant is just dirty work that if it paid enough, we, we'd probably find enough local people to do the work. But my guess is, and I'm sure economists have actually studied this a little bit more than me, I think we'd have to pay so much more that the tomatoes and the chicken would go so high that we consumers wouldn't want to pay that much anymore. Because I don't think you'd have a lot of Americans willing to do this for $10 or $12 or $15, maybe even $20. I think you'd have to just go really high up. I also think, though, and I don't, this is not a critique, but I just sort of see this pattern. I think we just we become too good for certain jobs. We just don't want to do the jobs that our parents or our grandparents did anymore. I, maybe we were soft, maybe we are wimpy, or maybe that's just sort of a natural evolution of an economy. So it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I'd love for you to, to think about this issue because that answer, that question comes up a lot. But I can tell you, uh, so was it, I think two years ago, Georgia came out with a really strong anti-immigration, anti-illegal immigration bill. Lots of the undocumented people fled the state. Do you know who complained the most bitterly? The farmers. There were billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of crops that were rotting in the field because they simply couldn't get anyone else to pick them. It's a very interesting question. What would it take for us Americans to do these jobs again that we no longer want to do. So, so, so this is the big problem. The problem with being here uh, with illegally is that you're open to gross exploitation, right? Because no, if you don't get paid minimum wage, what are you going to do? Complain? And if you complain, they'll report you to the immigration officers and you get deported. A lot of times it's far below minimum wage in terrible housing conditions. I mean, that'd be a start, right? A start would be somehow to force everyone to get minimum wage, but then even push it higher. But I think that that's, that's the, again, that's sort of part of the marginalization problem I'm talking about, is just they're open to gross exploitation. Now, of course, there are lots of employees who treat them very well, but there are some who, who are unscrupulous. In fact, sometimes don't pay them at all. Right, end the month come, they don't pay them, and what are they going to do about it? They can't go, they have no recourse. Yes, sir? Um, what correlation, uh, what, what would the effect be, or what do you think the effect has been, or better yet, the correlation 
of uh, America being a police force internationally over the past just over 100 years. <laughs> what do you think the correlation is between that and uh, immigration as we know it now? <laughs> That's a great question. What is the correlation between the United States having been a police force, a superpower now for many decades, and immigration? I would say that has made us more attractive because we have been able to export a lot of things that seem very attractive, whether it's the idea of freedom, liberty, democracy, or whether it's McDonald's and Pizza Hut. I think globalization, to not an insignificant extent, is Americanization. And people see that and say, boy, that looks good. And I, I don't know if, how many of you have traveled abroad and been to some of these poor countries. Yeah, I, whenever I'd go, I always come back and say, wow, things are a lot nicer in the United States. And it's not that, the, it's not that going abroad is the state, it's not that it's exceptional there, it's exceptional here, right? Most places are like it is over there. It's the US that's got nice sidewalks and lamps that work and clean running water that's reliable every single day. That's just not at all the case in many, many parts of the world. So I think the US's power and influence has, has in turn created a pull here. Sure. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think that kind of power can be attractive to some and really uh, repulsive and bullying, like you say, to others. Because I, I feel like, uh, like those terrorist nations, they, they felt like we were bullies and uh, they were, not only were they bullies, but maybe, maybe they had been jealous of our power. Right, some of these, their level. right, so some of these other countries have, 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 have feel bullied and, and are jealous of our power. And I think you're right, but you know, some of these countries are really bad countries, and they deserve to be bullied. I mean, I think the U.S. is right to go into some of these dictatorships and say, look, y'all need to change. You can't treat people this way. I, mean, I don't know if you've been reading about places like North Korea, but it's just awful. I mean, it's just unbelievably bad. Now, I don't know how much influence the U.S. has on North Korea, because they seem to be its whole other place. But yeah, I think power is going to rub people, some people the right way, some people the wrong way. Whether in the grand scheme of things that's good or bad, you know, and the U.S. power has also been abused. I mean, they've they've done bad things in certain places, lots of good things in other places. But I think it's sort of back to the question of of trade. I mean, it all hangs together. What the U.S. does abroad directly influences what people want to do here. It's a it's like, a great question. Like for instance, CIA meddling in Central America. Yes, that was, not a, that was not a highlight of U.S. foreign policy in the 1980s. <laughs> we take democracy much too much for granted, and we really shouldn't. It is an incredible privilege. That, it's an incredible privilege for me to be able to come out here, say pretty much whatever I want, have you attack me all you want, and have this exchange of ideas without any of us having to worry about what's going to happen to us tonight at home. We, we cannot take that for granted. I think democracy is much more fragile than people think it is. We need to, we need to nurture it. Yeah. Right. So the, the, so the U.S. Is, is partly powerful in order to try to protect democracy, not only here, but elsewhere. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about a lot of ways we can resolve this issue, but, uh, what No, I haven't. I've only raised lots of confusing questions. <laughs> I take no responsibility for any... I'm sorry? I think we should let in, we should open, we should let in more people who want to come to this country and regularize it. That's what I think we should do. I think we should just simply say, look, we're going to let in, we should do some kind of, I'm sure this could be done, just some kind of assessment. Okay, how many people does America need next year? 
and let's talk to the economists, let's talk to the sociologists, let's talk to the demographers, and settle on X number, and then have people apply and let them in. No, 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 that's not, uh, okay, uh, I got your point. So the point, I think the point system is pretty intriguing, right? I mean, um, I think, so they're definitely, like I said, the majority, like 70% of people coming to the United States are because of family reunification. There are people who say, let's replace that with the Canadian point system. I would say, let's have a balance. I do think there's value in having the grandmother, let the grandmother in. She's not a, a hot IT specialist. But you know what? She can be at home providing important daycare to children so that both parents can go off and work. I think there's a lot of value in family unification, but I think the point system is probably a, a good idea too. But I would say there, the point systems tend to emphasize the high skill, high educated people. But I think we'd also have to have a point system for, are you willing to come slaughter our pigs? Are you willing to come pick our tobacco? And I'm going to give you 20 points for that. Yes, sir, ma'am. Okay, so you're saying bring more people in, but we're having issues taking care of the people that we have here. Right. We're having problems with health care for the people who are here. You know, I work in the health care system where I see illegal immigrants come in, have babies, their babies get Medicaid, they get all, anything and everything that they need. Whereas I've got another mother here who just gave birth to another child. Right. I agree. I mean, that, that's a classic, that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a great issue. I can't really offer you a solution. But let me turn it around. Well, but what would you do? I mean, in that case, deny that child the health care, deny that woman access to the facility. That, that's not going to work either. That's, I guess, my problem. My, 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 kind of my point is we need to figure out a way to deal with this issue. We can't sort of pretend like, I'm not saying you're doing this, but you know, can't pretend like, well, they're just not here. I think there's some people who just want to pretend like they're not here, they're not part of our society, but they are here and you're seeing it every single day. So we've got to figure out a way somehow to educate them and to give them health care. But they're limited resources. But, uh, but I, I'd, like to, I'd like to think it's not an either or. I'd like to think we can come up with a way to take care of both, because both need it. So how are you going to, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting too much into discussion mode. I'm not repeating all the questions. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. No, no, I, I got it. So, so these are these are fantastic questions. So it all kind of hinges, comes back to the issue of who's going to do the work that's to be done that they are coming in to do, right? I mean, if if we can convince locals to do it, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. But why aren't they doing it? Okay, so that's an interesting issue. Now what you bring up is something really has nothing to do with immigration. It really has to do with, with domestic unemployment benefits. So you're thinking that forcing, you could force the unemployed to do the work that's currently being done by immigrants. Okay. Yeah, but 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 okay. That, that's one issue. But then the other issue is, are we consumers willing to pay the high price of the commodities that would be incurred because the locals are going to demand? There's, I, I'm pretty sure. You're gonna have a very hard time getting a lot of to meet the demand 
in a poultry plant at minimum wage among locals. Do you agree with that? I think that's, and I don't know, I don't know how to address that issue. It's a, it's a great problem. One could be just raise the wages, but then are you willing to pay more for that, uh, that boneless chicken breast at Food Lion? Sorry? Right. You bring up incredibly important issues. Please don't think I'm trying to like dismiss or minimize it. I simply don't know. I mean, and I think I think no one really knows, which is why this is such a controversial issue. Because people are asking exactly your questions and and it's 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 hard to to deal with. But it's easy to talk about this in this beautiful setting. You this is I hope you guys use this a lot. This is a, a fabulous auditorium. Should we are we are we good? Are we keep going? I'm One more question. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that the children of the undocumented who are born here are citizens, and therefore yes. they have a right to that health care. Uh, that is true. Now, of course, some people, like I said earlier, some people would say, well, let's, let's change that citizenship law and not, no longer make that possible. And there I'm pretty adamant. I think that's a lot of things I don't know about, but that's one thing I do know about. I think that would be a big mistake to change that birthright citizenship because again Europe's had it just a terrible go at it and if you think you if, if you think we've got problems here Europe's got a much worse is there a problem question way back there no okay yes ma'am With overpopulation here? I don't think so. No, I mean, we're, we're far from, we have, we're not, I don't want to misspeak, but I'm pretty sure we're no longer at replacement rate. No. Right? We're not replacing our, we're in fact our declining population. But yes, you're right, in China for a long time, I think they're loosening up, it wasn't two child, it was one child. It was a one child policy. You could have one child. And yeah, there were lots of forced abortions or very stiff penalties if you had more. They've, they've loosened that, that, I think, a little bit. But no, I, I do not see the United States having an overpopulation problem anytime soon. Far from it. I think almost all rich industrialized countries are having declining birth rates. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Some great, great questions, great complicated issues.